I used to become totally ecstatic in the car, and I would jump up and down, and I would go crazy, I would just have to sing songs, we're almost there, we're almost there, and I, I have loved the sea madly and crazily since I was a tiny child. And when we reached the water, I just ran, I had to beat everyone to the water, and I always beat everyone to the water, and I was the oldest grandchild out of 25. None of them would dare beat me to the water because I would beat him up. I had to be the first to the water and I ran to the water and I dove in and I was in the sea and I said, hooray, I love you. And that was the way I started as a child. When I finally uh, built my first boat when I was 20 years old at that same beach house, I had sailed through the South Pacific as a year for a year as a teenager. I was an avid surfer. And I was in Hawaii surfing. I was supposed to go to college. I met another teenager who had a little sailboat. And he said, well, we'll sail into the South Pacific. And I said, great, but I need my passport. I called my parents and I said, I want to sail away into the South Pacific. Will you mail me my birth certificate so I can get my passport? So my parents supported me from the very beginning. They never said no to me. They always helped me do whatever I wanted to do. They nailed me my birth certificate. I sailed into the South Pacific. Uh, that was 1971. And when I sailed into the South Pacific, I met uh, uh, the sailors that were hanging around with a guy who had sailed alone around the world and a half without stopping, Bernard Montessier. He was the first man in history to do that. So as a teenager, I was right next to the greatest long distance sailors in the world, but he was a visionary and they were all doing yoga. So I was 19 and I sat down and did yoga with them. We did breathing exercises. We sat in the lotus and we bumped our butt on the ground and we did yoga all night. And I got very, and I said, wow, this is great. I'm going to do this all my life. So I was around the greatest sailors in the world when I was a teenager. And I started doing yoga as a teenager and meditating realizing what it was. And the whole idea of going to sea alone, I realized that going to sea alone was a rite of passage for a shaman who wanted to receive the power so that he could give, uh, give to his culture and nourish their soul. And I realized that as a teenager. So I came back home, I said, Granddad, and I always kept in touch with my family. I always wrote my granddad letters, my family letters. We were close. So when I got back, I said, I didn't go to my dad. I knew I had to go to my granddad because I went to granddad and I said, Granddad, I want to build a boat in the family beach house. I want to stay here and build a boat, and uh, an ocean sailing boat. And he said, that sounds great. I'll help you. Of course, he never would have let his son do it. He made his <laughs> son go to engineering school like him. But by the time he was older and his grandson had had success sailing and written in great letters, he supported me. And then after he did, Dad couldn't say no. Dad built a little plywood and fiberglass catamaran when I was a kid in the early 60s. So when I built surfboards through high school. So when I was 20 and I got ready to build my first boat, I knew how to do it. And I, I, I was 19 when I started. I worked for uh, nine months. And during that nine months, I never went anywhere or saw anyone. I wasn't interested in anything. I didn't know about girls or guys or anything in the world. I built this boat. And I named the boat Tantra. I don't know how many people know about Tantra. I can only briefly tell you a little bit about it. It's one of the most powerful forms of yoga because it includes all of the different yogas and combines them together. So you're using exercises, visualizations, prayer, uh, the visual arts, and, uh, and, your, and your passion. And you're lifting that up to higher consciousness. I named my first boat Tantra. And when I did that, I truly had a vision where I was told, yeah, you're going to be taken care of, we're going to take care of you, you do what you want to do, we're going to help you. Just remember to give more than you receive. I started getting visions when I was a teenager, hearing words, that's what I heard, and I, and I accessed that through heavy yoga. Like a shaman accessed it by, by starving himself in the wilderness or at a fearful place. So now as a teenager, I had just built this tiny little catamaran, and my friend from the South Pacific who was uh, 24 years old, had sailed a 19-foot plywood boat through the South Pacific by himself for three years. And he came to North Carolina and said, why don't we take your catamaran to uh, 
home to Holland. I'm going home to see my parents. So I had an older guy who was truly a great sailor, who was my master, who made it possible for me to sail across the Atlantic. I didn't know what I was going to do. Now this catamaran weighed 1,400 pounds. That's lighter than the French windsurfer that went once across the Atlantic that's in the Maritime Museum in Paris. It weighs 3,000 pounds. This boat had no motor, no radio, no electronics, no life raft, no way to call for help. It was a tiny little catamaran named Tantra. And we went on a magical voyage together. My mom got uh, my first sailing press. I got pressed in high school for sports. I was already a sports star when I was in high school. So I was passionate and athletic. My mom got me my first press, and it says, well, uh, Reed, he does yoga every day. He sold his paintings to build the boat, and, uh, and he's, a, he's a budding philosopher, and, uh, and he's going out to sea on a spiritual voyage. And so back in, in uh, that was 1972, my mom told the story, the press, the press did the story, and that article is the truth. And it, it's the same thing 35 years later. It's the same story. So somehow, I was the same person since I was a child. And I was the same person when I set away in the little boat. And I sailed for three years on that boat. I was captured by pirates on the Amazon River, uh, up the Amazon River, right near Peter, where Peter Blake was murdered by pirates. Peter Blake, in the 80s and 90s, was the world's most famous sailor. He beat every race and every kind of boat. He's from New Zealand. And then he was made the new leader of the Cousteau Society. And he went with that Cousteau boat into the Amazon River. And one night the pirates came aboard with their guns out. Peter Blake ran inside to get his gun. He came out to fight the pirates and they blew him away. They killed him. But this was the same place where I was captured by pirates 30 years earlier. And I happened to have gotten on a French boat with my girlfriend. And we were tied up for three nights and two days. And there were things that happened with the pirates. They kind of had a fight between themselves. But they ended up taking everything from the boat and left us hogtied in the boat. We got away. We sailed out up to the Caribbean. And I said, well, I lost my boat. How am I ever going to, what am I going to do? I didn't know what to do. I became the yoga instructor at Club Med in Martinique. Because I was in Martinique and had no money. And I was with these French people. And, uh, um, and then I came down with hepatitis, which I caught on the Amazon River. So I said, Mom and Dad, please save me. Uh, bring me home. I need to heal up. That was a very magical time for me when I went to live with my parents. I, I was able to write the book of that story, of that voyage. And I did some very magical paintings of uh, the maps and the goddess looking over me, saying, everything's going to be OK, Reed, in the Amazon River, in my boat and the dotted line of my boat coming back to North Carolina. So I was programming my future by doing tantric meditations and making these paintings of the boat. And I decided, I'm going back to get my boat. And so I didn't get a job because I was busy doing my book and my magic meditation. So my dad gave me the airplane ticket. He said, now when you go back to the Amazon, you should cut your hair, put on this little disguise. When you go, so the pirates won't recognize you when you're going back to get your boat. Aha! So my dad helped me out again. And, uh, and I went, flew back down to the Amazon River, took a ferry boat out and up into the jungle, and, I, and to the place near where my boat was. And I remember early dawn, the sunrise coming above the jungle, and me looking out on the river. And there was my little catamaran, Ooh. still there. Four months later, I went back. And the Amazon River is so wide in the mouth of the Amazon River, you can't see the other side. So I knew if I could get to the other side, the pirates and the big speedboats weren't operating on the other side. So I got my boat to the other side and eventually made my way out of the Amazon River. And I had all kinds of other adventures, which I don't have time to talk about right now, but I ended up sailing back home. And, and when I came back home, I had the plan to build a scooter that could go anywhere in the world and, and sail the seas and not stop. Because I had seen the schooners that were built in this special island in the Caribbean named Becky. And I learned those things. So I had the plans for a schooner that I wanted to build. And I rallied my family and friends. And I built a 70-foot gaff rig schooner uh, as the ultimate long-distance heavy weather sailboat. Everything was given to me. I was all taken care of by the family. 
we went in our neighbor's uh, farm and we cut down the trees for the masts and the booms and, and we organically built this boat and I sailed away. I had all kinds of adventures on that boat. The years are passing. I chartered in the Caribbean for, for a long time. I made an expedition to Antarctica titled The First Arts and Cultural Expedition to the Seventh Continent. Uh, it was arts and cultural people to that continent that had never been visited by that type of person before. Before I went to Antarctica, I said, well, what can I do next? And I uh, knew that my friend, Bernard Montessier, had done the longest sea voyage in history at 300 and something days. And I took those numbers and I started to do the math in my head and I saw a slot machine and the numbers spinning and they stopped on one and three zeros. And I said, okay, that's it. I'll go a thousand days nonstop at sea. That was 1986. That made the Antarctic expedition a test for the longest sea voyage in history. Rather than the ultimate voyage for a sailor, it was a test for the longest sea voyage in history. So during the Antarctic voyage, I kept talking with, to my crew, who wants to go a thousand days with me? All we need is more of this and more of that, and we can go out at sea and keep living. That was 1986, and I worked in the years past, and I didn't have a financial base or a way to make money. I was an adventure sailor and I came to New York and I was given awards by the Explorers Club and I started to get press and trying to get sponsors and I started getting things donated. The Americans weren't responsive. I knew that the French were, were the greatest ocean sailors in the world and they, they have a lot of sponsorship and TV stuff. And I had a French wife at the time. We, we spent a couple years in France and they really helped us a lot. Um, but uh, because I didn't speak French well enough and I didn't, couldn't negotiate, I didn't get a sponsor, decided to come to New York. I spent 10 years in New York on West uh, 26th Street, Pier 66, a lot of you know the place, the owner of that historic floating barge and lightship, one of my biggest supporters. He took care of me and helped me in any way, every way, and helped me set off on this voyage. There were a lot of setbacks and so forth. Now, I spent quite a few years making test voyages. And one of the voyages that I made that was very important to set the stage for what I was doing was titled The Odyssey of the Sea Turtle. The plan was we would spend 200 days at sea, that's longer than any man and woman had spent at sea before in history, and we drew a sea turtle in the South Atlantic Ocean. I looked at the winds and the currents and I said, I think I can sail this course. If I go this way, the winds and currents go like this, I drew a sea turtle and I said, we're going to draw a sea turtle, it's going to be an environmental message. But the real message is going to be to go slowly but surely instead of fast and brash. This was the take from Aesop's Fable, the tortoise and the hare. It's going to draw the shape of the sea turtle, which we did. And it worked out. It was an incredible voyage. All kinds of things happened. Magic happened. And I got good press from that story. Like Associated Press drew the map of the sea turtle and told the world that I had gone out to draw the sea turtle to uh, uh, express the wisdom of going slowly but surely instead of fast and brash. And I saw it as a spiritual healing voyage. Because when someone looks to try to understand that, they don't have to be very smart. They can be from anywhere in the world and when they see the turtle, they know the Aesop fable story and, the, and that brings the connection. And bringing that connection takes them through mythology and back through time in a split second. And in that time, they're healed because they went into a contemplated high state. So I saw it as a spiritual healing voyage. So the voyages that I were doing was doing were reaching, starting to reach a higher scale and a different level than sailing had ever taken before. It took me a while to get what I needed to go a thousand days. I kept having setbacks, whatever it was. To have a big sailboat on your own um, is an expensive thing and it's an enormous amount of work. It's really difficult work. And uh, I got contributors over the years that helped and lots of people helping me. I never had what I needed until uh, I think I had what I needed enough to go. And I had a sweet lady that was going to go with me who I'd known for three years and who had been living on the boat with me for a year. During those years, I promoted the voyage in the yachting world, all over the world, and I never found anyone who wanted to go to sea with me for a thousand days. Everyone thought it was uh, impossible. The Explorers Club vetoed it. Bob Bollard, the famous Navy Explorer, said no man 
can live at sea. No people can live at sea for a thousand days without free supply. Impossible. Everyone said it was impossible. Every sponsor said it was impossible. Besides, no one could even understand what I was saying. No one had ever thought of anything like that. No one had ever given the idea to live at sea unsupported without resupply. But for that amount of time, that becomes eternal. Everyone thought it was impossible. So it was hard for me to get major help. So by the time Sonia and I set off, I didn't have everything I need, but I had enough food. My sails were old, my pulleys were old. But I had a good solid boat, and we set off to live at sea for a thousand days. She is a very uh, bright woman, yeah. a big spirit, and she understood, and she tuned in to me. I knew she could do it, and she trusted me. She had never been uh, at sea before, uh, but she made it 306 days, which is longer than any American man has been at sea. Only a few men in history have been longer. <laughs> so we are good completed the voyage, I think. She got very sick in the in the southern Indian Ocean. It was rough, and it's admittedly scary. Any man would tell you that when the storm, storms are coming and waves are breaking over the boat. You really have to trust your boat when, when you hear a crash bang that's this loud and waves are covering the boat and the boat leads over like this. She comes back up and she keeps going. But things are always breaking down in boats, every kind of boat. And it's, it's, it's difficult to keep a boat going at sea, or there would be more people who have been at sea for a longer amount of time. Sonia could have stayed longer, but she got very sick. And then we started to realize, well, she's late on her period, but maybe that's her psychological problem. We didn't know the story, but we were, the next stop was Australia, way ahead. And I said, man, you know, this is, this is really tough, you know, and she said, yeah, it looks like, looks like I have to go. And I said, yeah, it looks like you have to go. During the years, I said to anyone who wanted to go, they said, what happened if I get sick or hurt? And I said, well, you know, I can come near shore and let you off. So when she came on the boat, she came on the boat knowing if anything happened, I was going on, no matter what. I had given my life up to this expedition. I have a wonderful daughter who's now 33. Uh, uh, for, for almost 25 years of her life, she was listening to her dad talk about going a thousand days at sea. Now it's okay if your parents hear that because they have to support the child. But as a father, I'm sort of uh, responsible for my daughter. I should have been more responsible to her because I, what I thought what I was doing was great. I thought that was a benefit to her. What she really wanted was a dad to be there for her. And I wasn't there for her. So she said, I'm not going to be a professional surfer or sailor, which she was doing. I'm going to send myself to law school. And I said, I can't help you. I'm completely broke. She put herself through law school. She graduated number one in her whole school. And I said, well, Viva, how did you do that? And she said, well, this is what you taught me in a little girl when I was a little girl. When you lay down, you bring the healing white light of the universe into your toes, then your feet, then you bring it up through your body, and then you go out of your body and you expand into the universe, and then you can access your greater powers. And I'm looking at her, and I'm saying, you use those techniques to become number one in your law school? And she said, well, yeah, that was what I did after I studied and before my tests. So I said, well, you're wonderful. She's a genius girl who is a goddess woman because she accesses higher powers. Yet, the insecurity that I put in her caused her to be a lawyer. She wanted security in her life. She didn't want to be like me and be broke your whole life. Uh, so, but parents have to accept what little kids do. I gave up everything in my life for 25 years. Nothing was more important. No girl, no daughter, no mom and dad. Everyone who I love, nothing was more important to me and to do the thousand day voyage. I left everything behind. Sonia knew that, and she knew she couldn't go on. I was going on. By that time, we realized that we were doing something for humanity that was major. And it wasn't necessarily that people could understand it, and certainly I found that the media don't necessarily understand it. But when you're working in the subconscious, you see things that people don't see. And you see how we're connected together, and how we're one. Other people don't see that. So what happens in the subconscious is 
that certain people can influence humanity on a level where people don't grasp it, but they're close to grasp it, but they don't get it. So that's really a lot of what we did with this voyage. We were in nourishing the spirit of mankind. And Sonia, when Sonia got off the boat, she knew I had to go on, and she knew it was good, and she knew it was the right thing. She went home to her family in Queens. She found out she was pregnant. She uh, had our son and named him Darshan, which is to come and see the holy light. And she waited for two years for me to come back while I stayed at sea by myself. So I spent over two years at, at sea by myself, which is far longer than anyone's ever done it. And uh, already before that time, and I'm speaking to you about the spiritual collection, connection that I already had, and what is meditation? It's about letting your thoughts go, getting beyond your thoughts, getting beyond all material things, and entering into an exalted state close to God that's beyond thought and beyond the intellectual mind. So I lived in a state of exaltation close to God in many forms because I was tapping man through time. I'm a primal man. I told you I lived on the Amazon for a year in the jungle wearing little Indian flaps and eating rice and bananas and making wood carvings and doing uh, very powerful yoga exercises. But I was a primitive man. And I was a modern man going into the future because for 20 years I was promoting the psychology of humans going to Mars. And, and when I read what the psychologists that, that work with the Mars program wrote, I was kind of laughing a little bit because they're academics and they're looking at it from their study point of view. They have no clue of what it's really like to live in an isolated, high performance, death environment where you could die at any moment. And I had been experiencing that throughout my life, so I knew the psychology of it. So I was promoting seafarers of today to provide a role model for spacefarers of tomorrow, and going into the psychology of humans going to Mars. And I wrote a lot about it during the voyage. I worked with some Mars psychologists, and the gist of it is that in order for me to have survived at sea far longer than any human ever has in that dangerous environment, working really hard, I had to empower myself with a force greater than myself. And this is something that, say, a martial artist would understand because they're training from the ancient Tao, they're channeling in energy, they're focusing on it, and they understand how you bring a power greater than yourself and focus it there. And so that's what I did to gain the power do what I did on the voyage. I had to heal myself too. I had pain and I had the psychology. I think the psychology is what keeps man off the sea, especially by yourself, because anything can happen. Who can stay out there alone knowing that at any moment they could have an accident and die, or even more so, something funny that starts somewhere, that starts to give you pain and doubts and fears, and then you're no longer working from a high performance level and, and you're in a dangerous environment, you can die real fast. Lots of men have, and they've always gone crazy on the sea. So I learned a lot about spiritual healing, and I've been doing that all my life. And as I needed more and more spiritual healing, and as I needed more and more power, I entered into a state of oneness with the nature, and with the universe, and with humanity. And as I was accessing the power, I realized that I was also healing mankind and nourishing the spirit of mankind. And as I turned my focus over more to healing mankind and nourishing the spirit of mankind, I was healed better and gained more power. That's a very important thing that I learned. I could access power for myself and do a powerful thing. In the process of doing that, I realized that if I focused on mankind and all of their problems, and I breathed that into me, it was awful, dirty, negative stuff, but I could turn it into white light and love and I could send it back to them. And that was how I gained more power to heal myself and to physically do what I did out at sea. So I was out there uh, all alone with my mind not thinking about the sea. I never allowed myself to think of the sea. I entered into a state of grace with the form of God that comes in many forms, because like I said, I'm into many cultures, I'm into many religions, I've learned from all of them, I feel all of them, I'm spread out, I'm connected with every man through time, like the shaman who went out into the wilderness to be alone and bring back the knowledge for, uh, for his culture. And that's a story that goes through every culture of time and man, the, 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 the saints, the monks, Buddha, the yogis that went out into the wilderness 
they learn something that you don't learn when you're patting around with people because the chatter of your mind goes away. You connect with the form of God. And I was there 24 hours a day. It was very amazing. I would wake up in the night to uh, take a pee. And the moment I woke up, I would wake up in the night to take a pee. That was my uh, method of learning how to wake up a lot. Before I went to sleep at night, I drank four or five cups of tea, even if I was tired. I, I, and I stopped the ability to hold my bladder too well because I could pee any time I wanted. So that was how I woke up in the night, uh, 10, 15 times a night the whole, for the last three years. So I'd wake up in the night, and the first moment that I woke up, I would just go, God, thank you so much for allowing me to be here under your grace and fulfill my dreams. While I'm taking pee and looking to see if there's a ship, there's no ship, I'm laying back down going, oh God, this is, this is so wonderful, thank you so much, and I'd be falling asleep. So I entered into a state of connection with the, with the universe, and it went 24 hours a day, and none of the stuff that I'm thinking about now was there. I was totally tuned in. As it started to come back to Earth, timing, time was running out for me, and I felt like time was running out. I felt, man, there's so much more for me to know. I'm writing these things, and I need a little more time. So I stayed out longer than three years that I said I was going to stay. And as I was getting closer to come back, I... I didn't really want to come back. Everything was beautiful. I had everything I need. I could have stayed out there another year. I was still healthy. I never got hurt, never got sick. I had all the food, all the supplies, all the tools. I didn't need to come back. But I had a sweetheart and a baby, and I had my parents who were now in their 80s who supported every one of my sea voyages, and I felt I had to come back. So I had to come back. So as I came back, my mind started thinking more about society, I started adapting. I went from a timeless, eternal space to going, I gotta go at this speed to be here as I get closer to this speed to be here. I planned my arrival six months before I got hit. I said to my friends, uh, Let, send me the tie charts. Some people gave me some PR advice. They said, the major press doesn't want to see you on a weekend, they want to take their time off. They don't want to see you in the morning, they don't want to see you at night you got to come in in the middle of the day on a weekday. So I said, send me the tide charts for June. And I chose June the 17th at 1 o'clock. That would be when I would come in. So I timed my arrival to come in. And I would have been there, hit the dock at exactly 1 o'clock. But, but there was a big regatta that I came in with. And, and the press boat and the people who were helping me with that were going like, no, turn around and do the Statue of Liberty one more time with the press boat. So I turned the boat. It was a windy day. We got incredible photos. It was really exciting. And I turned around back and do the Statue of Liberty one more time so they could get these photos. So I was a few minutes late on the dock. You were almost right on the line. Right, almost right on time. Uh, uh, made it, I made it up the river. And, uh, and I, I hit the dock right where they wanted me to. And then I didn't look at anyone or anything. I just said, I gotta cut the motor off. I'm gonna be right back. I went inside, went in the motor room, cut the motor off, cut my motor valves, and I went to, to the sink and I washed my hands and washed my face. I had a new t-shirt that was like triple wrapped in plastic because everything else was dirty and moldy. I put on a new t-shirt and I, I looked around, I couldn't find my tennis shoes. <laughs> To wear, and I had more shoes in well over a year, a year and a half. But I had polished the only pair of black shoes I had in case I had to dress up. So I couldn't find my tennis shoes, I put on my polished black shoes. And I walked out on deck and I walked to the edge of the boat and I looked and it was quiet and there was uh, three, four hundred people looking at me all at the same time and I entered that exalted state of consciousness. Maybe you all have had it before. You see more than you normally do. I looked at those 800 eyeballs looking at me and I saw the people, I saw who they were, and I just said, I see a lot of people who I love! Yes! I them all! And I was like, what they wanted was what the media all wanted, and they told my friend who was organizing the press, was the moment he greets his sweetheart and son, who he's never seen. So that was ready. So as soon as I stepped up on the boat, my mom and dad were there, and my sweetheart and son, and I was trying to control my, my tears because I could hardly say I see a lot of people who I love. I was already crying. Tears were going down my face like mad. Those are tears of joy, which I cried a lot at sea. I cried a lot of tears of joy at sea. I stood on the boat and I looked at the ocean. I burst out in tears. Tears came down my face and I'm going, I love you, I love you, I love you. 
and tears are going down my face. So I'm used to that. I've cried a lot of tears of joy, but I, I knew I had my speech that I had to give, so I was trying to control myself. And I greeted my son for the first time, and I looked at him, and I, of course I was crying. I had a smile bigger than I've ever seen, because that photo that those press took, I, I was told it went to 300 outlets <laughs> into every paper of the U.S., and it went around the world because my friends started showing me their friends from Hong Kong and different places, sending that photo and that little story to them. And then I was back, and there I was with my loving parents. And in the speech, I, I said I couldn't have done it. I started by saying I had so much help to do what I was doing, and it started with my mother and father and my family who helped me build the boat. And I went on through my speech, and of course I spoke about Sonia. And I ended my speech by saying, uh, and how did I do these things that no man had ever done and no man can do? I, I still have a unique quality that I'm the only one who conceived of it or has the physical ability and the spiritual ability, the intellectual ability, all those things combined together to be able to do this. And I said, how was it done? Through the power of love. And I spoke about the power of love and what it does. And I said, it all starts with family love and what your parents give you when you're very young and throughout your life because that is the beginning of everyone and their roots. That builds your character. That's who you are. That's your strength. And it was family love that helped me do this voyage. I didn't talk about my parents much. They were there to help me every time in my life. I'm still a little boy to them. And I'm, I'm almost 60. They're in their 80s. And I'm still a little boy to them. And I go to them every time I need help. And every time I thought of them at sea, I just couldn't help it. I just cried and cried. Because I was ready to go. I had my motor brake. All my friends had helped me a lot. And they all knew when Reed's number came up on their phone, he's asking for help. So I, I was stuck in New Jersey. And no one was answering the phone. And finally, you know, I had to go to my parents again. I said, you know, I need this much to pay my motor bill so I can go. And there was a check in the mail. And it was for more than I asked for, and it covered me for other things. My dad's tight, he's Air Force. They don't have money, they're just retired Air Force military people. They don't really have money. So they, he's, he went into his money that he guarded his whole life. They've always been really conservative. And he gave me more than I asked for to help me get away. And that's why I dedicated, I, in my speech I said, I dedicate this voyage to my mom and dad. Because they're the ones that made it possible. That's almost the end of the story. So I was on a, a dock in Manhattan. And I was on Pier 66 for 10 years. The owner of that pier helped me. So the story ends when the boat comes home to my pier. But the, the state park knew I was coming and they knew I wanted to stay there. Man, they had to police everything on them. And they said, he can only stay for one day. And uh, I come back from the longest sea voyage in history in the <laughs> Riverfront Park in New York. I was there with their police making sure that they gave me one day and they thought that was a lot. And so, okay, I took it because that's my home here. That's where I had my return party. That's where the dance floor is. My friends came to the return party. A lot of you guys were there. And, uh, and I had different performers do things. And I have a friend who has a dance company, uh, Isadora Duncan style dancing, the first modern dancer, running in flowing robes like that. Well, she brought her girl dance troupe which was 10-year-olds to 15-year-olds. They were just so sweet. They were all long-haired girls with eyes like this who all had homeschooling who were doing the Isadora Duncan dance, dancing. And they made friends with, uh, with my son, Darshan. And he let all of them hold him. And then they went out and they did their dance and the music started. It's a big dance floor and they run and they flow their ropes. And he broke away. He got on his tiptoes and he started dancing like that. And he's not two years old yet. And, and, and you could see the people were thinking, oh, he's going to get crushed, knocked down by the dancers. And the, I could see at first the dance troop leader was worried about him. And the <coughs> people were going to try to grab him when he got close to the edge. And every, um, but everyone started cheering. And it was a magical moment because my little spirit, it somehow found Sonia and I way in the furthest part of the world in the Southern Ocean. He really must have wanted to come to her and us find us in that faraway place. 
And there was my little spirit that, I, that I'm sending forth in the world, dancing among these fairy dancers. And I felt like I was him. I looked up and the, these beautiful fairies towered above me. Their flowing robes were going like this. And they did their dance. And he danced among them. And when it was over, they turned to bow. And he looked around at them. And he copied them and turned around and bowed. Got, some of you saw it. Everyone was cheering. It was a beautiful, magical moment. And for me, that was the end of the story. So I had to leave the pier right away. It is where I am in New Jersey temporarily. That's where we're living together. And now, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got some things going. I've always had a mission. I don't have a mission now, except my mission is to share the voyage. My mission is to, uh, is to share love with the world and teach these things that made it possible. And then I'll see what happens in my life and how we go forward. But my focus is sharing the love and the message of the voyage. And that's the story. Welcome home! <laughs> what do the people at the Explorers Club say now when they said it couldn't be done? And what about the possibility of the world knowing about you through a book or something of that sort? Any of that kind of stuff in the window? Well, I was in the Explorers Club. Uh, you know, the name of the Explorers Club is real nice. I, I know enough to know that most of those guys are, are rich businessmen. They're not really explorers. They say they want me to come and talk. And I spoke with my friend who helped me do the PR. He's, he's an expedition. Uh, he has an expedition newsletter and does promo for expeditions around the world about whether I should go and talk and what I should do. Um, I guess I'll go and talk to them for their own benefit. There's a lot I could do for them, yeah. but I'm a little bit radical for them. But, <laughs> but 20 years ago, Condé Nast uh, Traveler magazine did a story on the history of exploration, the history of the Explorers Club, yeah. and the writer said, well, I was assigned to do this story. I went around the world with explorers, I went to the Explorers Club, and now I'm back in Manhattan, and the only explorer who I met with the spirit of adventure like Columbus and Magellan <laughs> Reed Stowe. Yeah. <laughs> and and they, those guys uh, snubbed me after that. Wow. <laughs> and so I had really not a, much of a connection with them. Uh, but the world at large. Now, the world at large, all of the French reporters said to me, if you were French, you would be going down the Champs de la on a dinner tape parade. You'd be a national hero. How do you accept uh, the American response to what you've done? And I said, well, I already had three years to be ready for that. Uh, because I knew that they didn't understand, and I knew that they weren't reporting on me. In fact, I had a, uh, uh, a series of really bad stories about me where they mocked me, and where they listened to people who were mocking me. They listened to aliases on the internet who put things up about me and printed that. In the, in the Daily News and in their sailing magazines, it wasn't the truth. So I had broken all the records of sea. I was satellite verified as the truth of what I had done, and I was still being mocked by the media. So by the time I got back, I realized that I wasn't going to be. I was. I knew that I was going to be thrown out of New York City. So I knew that I was uh, still a cast off and, and and being thrown out of New York. I knew that was going to happen. Uh, so I said, I said, I knew it was going to happen. But anyway, like I said, we did get huge press in America, and we did get huge press in the world, and every story was positive and beautiful. None of them were deep and were sharing a deep message, but all of the stories were positive and good. And I've done major radio, uh, uh, ABC, NBC, uh, NPR, and all of the writers, were, all of the interviewers were very sympathetic and the story went out good. So the, the press has all been real good. And so I think that there's uh, going to be a good response. And I had a, a, a literary agent who was an old friend of mine. and But I had five or six literary agents that wanted to represent me when I got back. But, but Peter Miller was the first one. He was calling me and he came to see me. And I said, well, look, you know, if, I, if, I, if, if I'm going to do a book, I know I need to do a book with a co-writer. Give me someone who has major credentials, bestseller, New York Times, to be my co-writer. Peter called me up the same day and said, I got the guy. You've got to come and meet it. And uh, so I figured, well, I'll go and meet this guy. But I want to make sure 
even though he's a writer and he's had bestsellers on the New York Times, that didn't guarantee me that he understood me or had the ability to interpret me to the world. And by the time the evening was over, uh, I had a, uh, um, a great uh, impression of a, of a man who not only had 17 bestsellers on the New York Times, mm -hmm. but um, was a wise guy who was like an older brother to me. And I, and I immediately said, what do I want? Why am I going to meet all these other literary agents and writers? This is the connection. And there's the man, uh, David Fisher, right there. Oh, sorry. He's here tonight. Yeah, yeah. So David is the one who's going to interpret my story in a form that's readable for the mainstream public. Because I'm kind of extreme and poetic, and I'm not a wordsmith, and so I'm real happy to have David here. And um, um, he's, he he understood me, and he let me know that he got me, and in a very very uh, subtle way. He didn't pound it on me. He, he spoke to me, and I understood that, that he was right. And then I said, why do I have to look further? And right away, I, I went with him. May you prosper. May you prosper. And I think he'd be great for the speaking circuit and for television. Absolutely. Absolutely fantastic for the multimedia world. I just, want, I just wanted to uh, ask you about the God experience. I'm glad you realized that you didn't need an intermediary to experience this, uh, this sense of God. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit of, more about your God experience in this voyage and uh, how it, it, it enabled you to, to continue on? Okay, uh, that's a deep question and it's the first question and I'll go on to answer it. When I, when I shared this voyage, I, I wrote uh, uh, in my com uh, computer and I sent a picture and a story back every other day of the voyage. Some of my friends here have followed me every other day of the voyage. We, we had a lot of people follow me, and I got a lot of great uh, response from a lot of people who were very moved by it. Uh, when I, I'm very careful to talk about God or, or Buddhism, most of the very powerful yoga techniques that I learned, I learned as a teenager, and I got them from Evans Wentz, if anyone knows Evans Wentz, was uh, the first one to write the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and he was a very important writer, and in those books I found these very powerful yoga exercises that I've been doing for uh, over 35 years since I was a teenager. Uh, and so and I don't talk you, about Buddhism, and I don't you. talk about God, because I want to talk mainstream, so I try to say I became one with nature. People understand that. Yeah. If you're going to live at sea, how do you live at sea? You have to tune into the nature. So if you tune into the nature, you reach a oneness with the nature, and, and the communication with nature is what empowered me to do the voyage. So, uh, so I usually try not to speak of God because that makes people think of things right away. And I usually, and I don't talk about Buddhism because I don't want people to think, well, I'm a Buddhist, but but they have incredible, powerful techniques that are very, very strong and, and life-giving and very, very good for humanity. I'm not promoting Buddhism or God. I'm trying to promote something that everyone can understand in their heart and, and apply immediately to their lives without having uh, them think of what all those two words and other words like that make them think of. So it was my connection with this, this higher force that comes in all forms man has connected to from the beginning of time and in living connection with that, that force and in that state of mind I left everything in the world behind and, and my day was filled with grace and thankfulness that I was being given this gift of being able to uh, uh, connect with the light and love of the universe and have big, big, endless visions and feeling like what was coming from my heart was going to every man and every woman and every person through time and to humanity and to the future. And I kept feeling that and I kept seeing it and it's a big vision and that was my vision. And of course, 
I saw God as a 60-year-old, well-muscled, bald <laughs> man with a long beard because the Italians made such beautiful paintings. <laughs> I'm an artist and I love art and the, and the paintings of God the Italians made were so beautiful. So I see God like that. And, and, and I love the way that uh, Jesus looks and, and, and I have a few paintings of Jesus that are really my favorite. That, that, that really show wonderful character of a young bearded man with, with love in his eyes. And I have, I have clear visions like that. And, and, and uh, I love Buddha. I'm very attracted to the Oriental stuff. And the goddess Tara, the Greek goddess is the uh, goddess of protection, who I called on to protect me. But Tantra is about loving God in the form of your con cosmic opposite. So I found that as a young man, and see, to transmute my sexual energy into spiritual energy, I was very attracted to God in the form of a beautiful woman. So I see this gorgeous, naked woman sitting there, presenting herself to me, saying, I love you. And that kept my concentration. And that way I lifted my spirit to God in the form of my cosmic opposite, a beautiful woman. So I love God in all the forms. And when I pulled ropes so hard, and my hands were cold and frozen in the ice, and I, I had to work so hard, my hands and wrists became sore, so that when I pulled the ropes, I was in pain. Yeah. And at night, when I laid down and I put my hands down, I had to heal myself. And usually, I always say, God, thank you, thank you. I don't ask for anything, I just say thank you so much. But I said, uh, God, please, tell Jesus to come down and take this on. <laughs> And I, I saw this wonderful picture of Jesus that I knew. And he came down. He, he was coming down to take my arm. And I said, God, tell Buddha to heal this arm. And I love Buddha. He came down to take this arm. And God came a little bit closer. They all came closer together. And you know what? They bumped heads over me. Yeah. And then they laughed. And then Buddha looked at me and winked. So I get these kind of uh, spiritual visions that are out there. And these visions made it possible uh, for, for me to be healed and to uh, physically accomplish something that no human had ever conceived or attempted before. Definite speaker picture. <laughs> how did you how did you get food, how did you get water, how did you main, manage to keep a computer running and be in touch with that's, the world? That's really important. Uh, you're talking about a lifetime of knowledge put together for this voyage. That's why I told you the history of my childhood. I learned since I was a, a, a teenager how to stock up a boat with food. And I had to do it low budget, but it had to last for this many months. And so I learned about rice and beans, brown rice and beans, and, and what food would last, and oats and dried fruit lasts forever. And I needed a special cheese that would last indefinitely. And I knew Parmesan cheese would last indefinitely. So I approached Parmigiano cheese, the best cheese in the world, Parmigiano Reggiano, most expensive cheese at the store. And the lady uh, uh, became an immediate friend, but, I, but she's been my sponsor for 15 years. Because it was 15 years ago I went to her and said, I'm going a thousand days, will you help me? And she says, when do you want the food? And I said, now. And so uh, I, I've been stocked, I stocked up the boat for over 10 years. I, I didn't just pack the boat at one time and have to organize it. No, it just came. And so for 10 years, I had a huge stash of Parmesan. She had to replace it before I left. But a lot of the food companies were donating to me over the years. So I eat really good food. I knew I had to uh, uh, cook with uh, propane fuel, so I had this many bottles. I had all the food. It's a big schooner. I could carry as much weight as I wanted. I had uh, some of my best friends in town are computer geeks, so they got computers for me off of eBay and programmed them. And they got the uh, uh, friend of mutual friend of many of us in here got a satellite telephone donated to the project. Ten years ago, that phone worked the whole way through the voyage, but the computers lasted about a year and a half each, a year, a little more, before they froze up. I always kept them wrapped in triple bags with desiccants, and I used them inside. But they, the salt air is in the environment, and the computers lasted for. Uh, the last six months I didn't have the computer, so I couldn't do my updates or send photos. That was a good opportunity for me. I was communicating with too many people, and it allowed me to be more alone. And I wanted that. I was actually very happy with that, because all of my writing became much deeper. Instead of short essays daily like that, 
I gave more thought to what I was writing and they became, you know, instead of one page, six and eight pages long, I was going deeper into my thoughts. And I've always been a painter, as I say, and my paintings became much richer and deeper because I wasn't trying to produce one every other day for my update. I was not hurrying through them, so I got a little bit bigger and took longer. So the new writings and my new paintings are better than the early stuff that I did during the voyage. I didn't talk about the art, which the art that I've done through my life is what empowered me to do the voyage. And you can understand that because early man discovered that if they made a figure bit on their boat, that they could succeed at what they had to do. So that was how the art that I've always done, and I told you the story of how I made the paintings of the goddess looking at me in my boat sailing back home again. I did a lot of that stuff. All my charts were painted up. So I think I answered How did the uh, stars and constellations look from up there, out there? Well, you know, you're in, you're in under this giant dome the whole time, so you see everything very clearly, and uh, and it's very amazing. I laid many a night out in the cockpit uh, and, and fell asleep under the stars. And, and, I, and I learned to love them and, and guide the boat by the stars. I stopped navigating for almost a year. That's never been done. I knew I was out in the middle of the ocean. I knew I was OK. I didn't care where I was or where I went. Did you get that big patch of plastic somewhere? That's in the North Pacific. I decided not to go there. And I decided not to go there because I looked. I was reading a thing about that particular area of the ocean, and they said, well, it's all cloudy during this time of the year. And I said, well, I don't want to go where it's all cloudy. I'd rather go where it's nice and sunny. So I didn't go where the plastic was. How did, how did you deal with other ships? Uh, I had a collision with the ship only uh, less than a 1,000 miles out. It's such an incredible, rare occurrence that that <laughs> happened. It's amazing. I was just beginning the voyage, so I was really on watch in the night looking out. I had all my lights on. And you know, if you're inside of a pilot house and you have one little green lead light on on an instrument, that green red, that green little green light bounces off of all of your windows. So the inside of those ships, with all their array of equipment, they can't see out. They can't see over the cargo. Have you ever seen a load of cargo ship? What they look like? They can't see forward. I don't know why they weren't looking in the radar. I don't know why a multi-million dollar ship with a multi-million dollar cargo didn't have a man looking forward. They were on autopilot, and we collided in the night. What hit the ship was my figure. My figure hit was going out over the front of my boat. I, I, I figured it out later. The first thing that hit the ship was my figure hit, and it broke. And then the long pole in front of the boat called the bowsprit, which holds a big sail out, it mashed and bent back. And I lost my whole forward rig of the boat, and, the sh and it went bang. So I was so lucky to be alive. It was only a few split seconds because, because or we'd be dead. Totally crushed. We'd be dead. Well, I called the ship on the radio and I, and I said, wait a minute, I might be sinking. And they got me, they answered to me. And I, I looked at my bilge and water wasn't coming in. I went outside and I looked and I didn't see anything broken but the front of the boat and the bowsprit. And, and I called them back and they said, do you want us to rescue you? And they said that and I said, no, I'm not sinking. Uh, thanks anyway. Uh, I'm, my name's Scooter Rand, and they gave me their name. And they and they went on. And uh, and when daylight came, I sent up the photo back. It's on the website. This huge steel pole, that's 20 feet long, was mangled and bent back. And I lost my two head stays. And it took me a month to prepare the boat to go forward. And the way I did it was shortening the cables down with the big cable clamps. I showed pictures of how I did this. I used up all my hacksaw blades uh, on, uh, in only not even two weeks out, sawing the steel. And I have a big boom, and I moved the big boom to the front of the boat. And I used it as a crane to pull this steel apart and lift the steel. And it took me a month to fix the boat, sail away, and the boat was uh, with two pieces of chain that wrapped around the front of the boat that held the mass forward. And I did the whole voyage with the disabled boat. Without the sail in front, the boat doesn't balance. So if I want to go forward against the wind, I have to turn the rudder to compensate. So I'm going forward with my rudder behind the boat. Instead of straight, it's bent to the side like this. So it caused me to drag and drift sideways. So I did the whole boat with the, di the whole voyage with the disabled boat with chains wrapped around the bow of the boat. I knew I couldn't turn back. I knew I had to go forward. After that, I never ever came close to a ship. And I went uh, sometimes a month without seeing a ship. 
they, they and take I thought that uh, coming back to New York, I would see a lot of shifts, so I stayed up all night coming in. I kind of dozed a little bit outside because I didn't want to, you know, like completely waste myself staying up all night. I never saw a ship the whole night coming or going out of New York City. They, they weren't that many ships. And, and then I sailed in on the morning of the next day. So, but I went weeks without seeing ships. And one of the most the, the irritating thing about the voyage was feeling that I had to look for ships 15 times a night and, and throughout the day just in case a ship was coming because I knew they wouldn't be looking for me. But I never had a ship come close to me again after that. So it was an incredible, amazing coincidence. And, but we made it. The boat's like that now. She still has the chain wrapped around. The dock. I don't know how, how or when I'm going to be able to fix the boat right now because I don't have the finances. They, they didn't take any responsibility? Uh, the ship didn't take responsibility. Uh, but the company that represents them uh, uh, started fighting us. And I'm in the process of trying to get them to help. I'm going to be approaching them and saying, well, don't you want to help me? I did the longest sea voyage in history. And if they don't, I'm just going to say, well, geez, you know, I never had an accident in my life, but you'll make a great story in my book and my video about how you didn't want to help the little guy who you crushed at the beginning of the longest sea voyage in history. I hope to ask them first nicely to help me, and if they don't, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to just tell the story in my book and my, in my video, and, it, and that won't look so good for major shipping. He so wants the name of this ship and knows that happened. Yeah. They'll help me. I don't know if they will. They could get a hell of a PR bump out of that. Uh, by helping they could ride in your pocket and get away. Well, also, I mean, they're supposed to give away to sailors. They're supposed to give away to sailors. Yeah. But that's 